Thank you, You're welcome. Yes. All right. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, how cute. <laughs> Whoa. I'm impressed. That's a nice okay, I want to give the teachers credit. I did not see that coming. <laughs> to our young people this morning, we welcome you because you're here. This is a much more wonderful event. And I want to just say to all of you, this is... The thing that motivates us is you guys. We want you guys to have great parks and make it a great part of your youth. You look back on the wonderful time you spent in parks and playgrounds and all the great things that you did when you were a kid. So thank you to these wonderful children who are, be who are here today. Let me ask you a question all the children. Do you want us to spend more money on parks? Yeah. <laughs> I can't hear you. Do you want us? There you go. The people have spoken. <laughs> because of their demands, we will now spend more money on parks. Yay. See, that's how democracy works. It was that simple. <laughs> so let me, let me say something that we don't probably think about enough here in our city, but it's true. Parks are one of the great treasures of New York City. We don't sometimes stop to realize just how big a part of life here in our city parks are. But the number is amazing. 29,000 acres of parkland in New York City. It's about 14% of all the land in the five boroughs is parkland. Mitch Silver has a big job on his hand as our parks commissioner keeping track of all of that and making it work for the people of the city. It is a vast part of life in the city. But it's also another example of inequalities that have plagued this city over time. Some parks did very, very well. Other parks didn't, didn't have the resources they need, didn't get the support they deserved. And we're here today to take a major step towards addressing those inequities and showing what a path is to a city where each and every neighborhood, each and every borough, each and every park gets the support they deserve. You know, parks to us, and I say this as a parent in particular. Parks are so many things to us. They're where our families gather, gather for birthdays and barbecues and athletic competitions. Parks are our playgrounds. Parks are another part of how we educate our children. There's so many roles that parks play. And I often like to remind people, for a lot of people in this city who don't happen to have a lot of resources, parks are where they go for their vacation because they don't have the option to go out of town. So parks we depend on for so much in this city. It's truly a necessity in urban life to have a great park system. But again, not all parks have been treated equally. Not all parks provide enough or maintain the way they should be. So for some people, the experience in the park is great. In other neighborhoods, we have a long way to go, and that's what we're here to address today. And it will not shock you that this often aligns to the reality of demographics. It often aligns to the income level of the neighborhood. In many low-income neighborhoods, parks have languished without the support they deserve. They haven't gotten enough support from the public sector. They haven't gotten enough support from the private sector and nonprofits. Again, we aim to change that with this announcement as a first big step today towards equality. The vision we announce today will reach all across the five boroughs and will set a new pace for fairness and equality in parks funding. I want to thank the two key leaders of my administration who have been devoted to this mission. They feel it very personally, very deeply and they're doing a great job in making this a reality. Of course, our Parks Commissioner, Mitch Silver, and our Environmental Protection Commissioner, Emily Lloyd. Let's give them both a round of applause and thank them. And for those of you who don't know, Emily has a major role in our parks because DEP has, does so much regarding the infrastructure of our whole city and our parks, but also Emily, before her current role, was the president of the Prospect Park Alliance. So she has a special passion for our parks. And you could, yes, you can, yeah, we can we'll clap for Brooklyn here. We like to have a Brooklyn moment wherever we are, don't we, Tish? Now, I want to thank all of the elected officials who are here today. I want to acknowledge some others you're going to hear from a little later on. 
I want to say thank you to all of them for being so supportive of our efforts. I want to thank State Senator Toby Ann Stavisky. You can clap for all these folks. <laughs> Assembly Member Ron Kim. Yay. Council Member Peter Ku. And here on behalf of Borough President Melinda Katz, I'd like to thank Barry Gradonchek of her office for his great support, and her great support. Melinda is one of the people who has invested in this initiative, and we thank her for that. A lot of advocates, a lot of people who do so much to make our parks work are standing here behind us and among us. And a lot of times, I think I can say, I've talked to so many over the years, uh, sometimes I felt it was a lonely struggle trying to make sure that the agenda of parks was heard at City Hall. I hope you feel a little less lonely today. Your agenda is being heard and acted on. Let's thank all these advocates, all the folks who work in our parks. And another elected official has just arrived. We welcome Assemblymember Brian Kavanaugh. So the initiative that we are announcing as a major first step towards fairness and equality in our park system, we call it the Community Parks Initiative, CPI, Community Parks Initiative. And the focus is on the parks in each and every neighborhood, especially where the need is greatest. We're starting with a $130 million capital investment. $130 million comes from two key sources, $110 million from our mayoral capital budget, and then another $20 million in funding from the City Council, from Borough Presidents, and from Foundation Grants. We set the goal of making sure this funding would reach where it is needed most. And Mitch and his team worked tirelessly to develop the right criteria. They identified 35 parks across the five boroughs that were the highest priority. What made them the highest priority? Well, this is a pretty astounding fact. Each and every one of these 35 parks over the last 20 years or more has only received a total of $250,000 in capital investment. So these are parks that over the last two decades or more only got $250,000 in capital investment. Tremendously needy for that reason. They are also parks that happen to be in fast-growing neighborhoods where the need is greatest, in neighborhoods that often have a substantial low-income population, in neighborhoods that are often particularly dense in population. So there's tremendous need around these parks in addition to the fact that they haven't gotten the investment they deserve. Using the same criteria, we've identified another 55 sites that need some immediate targeted improvement, so they will get that help as well, again, areas of particular need. That's the capital piece from the park side. It's also important to note that there will be a major capital investment by the Department of Environmental Protection, an additional $36.3 million from DEP for green infrastructure improvements in our parks. So it will make our parks better but it will also protect our environment and our future. On top of that, there is an expense budget investment of $7 million. You'll hear from Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito in a moment. This money is primarily from the City Council with some mayoral money included. This covers a whole range of needs, including recreation programs, maintenance staff, gardeners, and powerful efforts to work with the community and community organizations to get them to play a bigger role in our parks. So there's a very big investment being made here today. Let's talk about this park as an example of why we're doing this. Bound Park, Bound Playground, I should say, next to PS20, two blocks from JHS 189. Obviously, this is a place where many, many children come for recreation. It's a place that's going to be used constantly and needs a lot of support. In the last 20 years, this park has gotten less than $60,000 in capital investment. Again, over two decades. With very limited resources, Parks Department workers have done what they've always had to do in recent decades, uh, make lemonade out of lemons, make something out of nothing. They've done an amazing job with very limited tools finding a way to make parks work for all New Yorkers, particularly for our young people. 
But 20 years is a huge amount of wear and tear, nonstop use. You can imagine how much investment would have been needed. We're trying to start making up for that now. And I want to take this moment to say this is a first step. But again, it's been decades of disinvestment in our parks, decades. And again, it did cut along demographic lines. So this is an important first step, but there's going to be a lot more to do in the future to make up for this history. What kinds of things need to be done here? Well, there's cracked asphalt, there's old play equipment and benches, there's a lot of concrete, as you can see, there's not much greenery. And what we're, one thing the Parks Department has been doing a great job on recent years is replacing concrete with greenery, with field turf, with better options for kids. All those upgrades are needed. Take this as one example of those dozens and dozens of parks that are going to benefit from this initiative. We've made clear the goal of this administration is to create one New York, to create a place of opportunity for all and fairness. It includes, obviously, having parks that reflect those values. So today's a first step. And the public sector is putting our money where our mouth is. We will, I assure you, we will also turn to the major parks conservancies and ask them to make a substantial contribution to this progress. It's the right thing to do so that we can address, again, decades of inequity, and we expect to get some real important contributions from the conservancies as part of this process. I want to do a moment in Spanish, and then I will bring up some of my colleagues to speak. Para asegurar que cada New Yorkino tenga acceso a hermosos parques. Estamos invirtiendo 130 millones en toda la ciudad. Esto ayudará a fortalecer a las comunidades y a reducir la desigualdad. With that, I, I want to thank the City Council for their focus, their intense focus on this issue, and they're willing to make key investments. Uh, they've also put their money where their mouth is, and I'd like to welcome Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito. Well, good afternoon. Buenas tardes a todos. It's really a, a pleasure to be here alongside all of colleagues in government, in particular our local council member, Council Member Ku, and Mark Levine as chair of the Parks and Recreation Committee. Um, let me ask a question, and this is also for the press corps. Anybody here, raise your hand if you have visited a local park or playground. Raise your hand. <laughs> right? So this is something you may not have visited every neighborhood in New York City, but neighborhood parks, local parks, and playgrounds is something that is part of our lives. And in living in a dense urban environment, as the mayor indicated, these areas of reprieve are really important for all of us. And no one community uh, should be left behind as we look at investing taxpayer dollars uh, in equalizing the playing field, so to speak, right? And making sure that every child in every community uh, has access to a green space in which it's being invested. As the former chair of the Parks Committee, this was a constant battle that I engaged in with the last administration that had a completely different vision. Many times it is us as council members that are the ones providing the only source of funds to our local parks and playgrounds. And a lot of times we were not able to put in all the amount needed because we have limited funds available as council members. Um, and sometimes park improvements cost way too much. So at times the money was just languishing there because the city would not invest and put the amount necessary to make sure sure those parks projects happen. So that really is, uh, I really want to thank the mayor for continuing to fulfill his promise of making sure that we do not live in that tale of two cities, that this is one New York for everyone. And to understand the level of priority that has been given, real thoughtfulness of this new parks commissioner in looking at creating an initiative in which we looked at the high needs playgrounds and parks in our neighborhoods uh, to, to know that there are local playgrounds and parks that in 20 years received less than $250,000 in capital improvements. That is an incredible injustice. And so I really want to thank 
uh, the mayor for that and the commissioner Silver for his commitment. In total, the New York City Council has put in about $9.4 million in capital monies. Uh, and as the mayor indicated, in the expense side, $5 million that we've been able to allocate to provide some of the maintenance personnel uh, that are needed to really continue to provide day-to-day -day services in these local parks and playgrounds. Uh, again, a, a commitment that we did not have from the prior administration. So it really was a shame as someone who represents a low-income community that is always, always looking for more active recreational space and passive recreational space. Uh, we did not have the level of support from the prior administration in taking to a look at the needs of our uh, local communities. So it really is important. Every local bit of green space matters to us, and many of these small community parks just do not get the proper support. These are parks that make our neighborhoods livable, that make our under-resourced communities dynamic and sustainable places to call home. Every community in New York City deserves to have a spectacular park, no matter where you live or what your zip code may be. And every community clearly deserves quality green space. Today's Community Parks Initiative furthers that commitment by analyzing the needs of parks in New York City and harnessing public resources to effectively meet those needs. This comprehensive program will bring long-term investment into our city's parks, as well as more short-term improvements that New Yorkers will be able to experience right away. With a firm commitment to year-long intergeneration programming, the Community Parks Initiative will help our parks meet their potential as dynamic spaces that truly make our neighborhoods vibrant and sustainable. So again, I want to thank the leadership of this mayor, who continues to believe in all neighborhoods and in all communities in the city. And again, as the former chair of the Parks Committee, it's a really proud day after the battles that we had in the last administration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You may not. Oh. Espanol? <laughs> okay. Eh, estamos aquí hoy eh, para darle las gracias al alcalde y al comisionado del Departamento de Parques eh, que están presentando una iniciativa hoy donde vamos a ver una gran inversión en diferentes parques a través de comunidades pobres, en comunidades donde no hemos visto un nivel de inversión de parte de este gobierno. Eh, y hoy se está eh, presentando con la colaboración del eh, Consejo Municipal que de nuestra parte estamos invirtiendo 10 millones, eh, bueno, 15 millones en total que estamos invirtiendo a esta iniciativa en colaboración con el alcalde. Así que les damos las gracias para crear más eh, parques vibrantes en nuestros vecindarios y es un gran día para todo New York. Thank you very much. So the public advocate could not contain her enthusiasm earlier. The mention of Prospect Park. Uh, when we were young and we were council members in neighboring districts, a lot of our attention went into Prospect Park and parks in our communities because we felt very personally what it meant to families in our neighborhoods. Uh, Tish James has been a very active advocate for fairness and equality in parks funding, and it's very fitting that she is a part of this announcement here today. Our public advocate, Tish James. Ni hao. Uh, <laughs> buenos dias, uh, good morning, and to the press, good day. Uh, so, promise made, promise kept. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I grew up playing handball in Red Hook, public playground and in their parks. I grew up running track in Sunset Park, and I've watched a number of concerts in Fort Greene. Each and every playground and park the handball courts are now cracked. The track field is weeds. The benches that I once sat on for concerts are nothing but rubble. It all really represents benign neglect over the decades. And as the speaker indicated, it was the last previous administration, it was a struggle to get funds to community playgrounds and to parks. It was really all about legacy projects and big major capital projects as opposed to communities that really make our city great. And so it's a great day in New York City where we are basically sharing the wealth of New York City with communities that have been ignored for far too long. Children need to grow. They need space to run. 
They need places to jump rope and double dutch and single rope. They need to run and just be children and not have to be locked behind the walls of a building. And so that's what really this is all about, so all of you can grow. And to recognize that part of the educational experience, part of climate change, is really a focus on our public parks and our playgrounds in the city of New York. I want to thank the mayor, I want to thank the speaker, I want to thank my colleagues today and, and for believing that all of us, that all of us should have the same beautiful playground that other communities enjoy in this city. I thank you. It's a great day in New York City. I'd like to bring forward a true friend of Parks, also someone who understands communities from the grassroots up, Grace Meng. I've walked the streets of her community with her. With her. I know she knows what her constituents are feeling and what they need, and I'm thrilled that she's here today in support of this announcement. Congress member Grace Meng. Good morning, everyone. It's It's great to join Mayor de Blasio in announcing this important initiative today. I also want to thank Commissioner Silver and Lloyd and our Queens Commissioner Dottie Lewandowski. Uh, thank you. Yes, you can clap for them. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor, once again for coming out to Queens, to our district, and for the city's commitment and prioritizing towards increasing the accessibility and quality of parks in our neighborhoods throughout all the five boroughs. Until the de Blasio administration stepped in and made this issue a top priority this year, nobody at City Hall focused on the problem of parks, parks inequity, especially here in Queens. This administration did a thoughtful and careful job of laying out a comprehensive plan for New York City's parks, a framework for an, in, for an, an equitable future to build a more inclusive and innovative park system. The Framework's Community Parks Initiative takes a strong step towards recreating underserved community parks in densely populated and growing neighborhoods with higher than average concentrations of poverty. It is clearly important to this administration that local residents and community stakeholders have a real voice in the decision-making process, and I want to thank so many of them for being here today. We've needed an administration that will bring a renewed focus to parks like this one that have been historically ignored, and DOPR is taking a strong step in this direction. Once again, I applaud the mayor and his administration for moving forward with this ambitious plan. I'm so proud to be here with my local elected official, Senator Stavisky, Assemblyman Ron Kim, and especially our great councilman, Peter Koo. Preserving, improving, and investing in parkland is critical to the quality of life here in Queens and throughout the city, particularly for our children, our families, and so many senior citizens. Working with the mayor and the Parks Department on this initiative, we can all ensure a greener future for New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grace. You know, there's been a real uh, debate in this town the last couple of years over the issue of creating more fairness towards our parks. This has been a very important, a very healthy debate, a very long overdue debate. A lot of people, again, here today fought for years to get this issue uh, front and center. I want to call up uh, State Senator Dan Squadron because I think he deserves special credit for putting forward ideas that really gave some extra energy to this discussion and focused attention on the fairness we need and the ways that we can get there. And I think that he played a very, very positive and constructive role in this debate. State Senator Dan Squadron. Thank you very much uh, to the mayor uh, for his leadership today and on this issue, to uh, the speaker, former parks chair, to Councilmember Levine, the current parks chair, Assemblymember Kavanaugh, Commissioner Silver, uh, all of whom uh, we have had uh, uh, conversations and uh, pushes on this equity issue for so long. And so I thank all of you for your partnership and leadership on this. I also want to thank all of the advocates uh, and organizations that support parks across the city. Our park system is stronger because of them. 
Especially, I want to thank some of those smaller parks uh, and conservancies that sometimes get left out. Gene Silva from Flushing Meadows Corona Park, who has traveled all over the city for these issues. Kay Webster and others from Sarah Roosevelt Park in my district. Vivia Morgan from Wingate Park in central Brooklyn. Uh, and so many others, too many to name today. Uh, we're standing here today with a very exciting announcement, but a year and a half ago, uh, folks were simply not talking about parks equity. But even then, we already faced a parks equity crisis. First, across the city and the whole system, parks, especially those in the communities of the greatest need, suffered from chronic underfunding. Second, an unintended consequence of the success of some of the conservancies and some of the marquee parks in the city meant that New Yorkers fortunate enough to live near one of those parks probably didn't realize that overall the system was not being taken care of as much as it needed to be. Those parks are doing better than ever and we celebrate that. But we can't let some of the system fall behind while other parts of the system create the appearance that there's no problem at all. Well, thank goodness a couple of things changed. First, Mayor de Blasio made a clarion call on the equity crisis and made clear that he would not allow it to stand. Second, for the first time in years, everyone, including the most successful conservancies, came to the table and were truly invested in solving the equity crisis. And today, less than a year and a half later, Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner Silver are addressing the most glaring inequities in neighborhood parks across the city through the community parks initiatives. This is a dramatic, coherent, need-based system that addresses the crisis. In an unprecedented way, it treats every park in every neighborhood as an integral park of the, a part of the entire system that must be considered, improved, and live up to the need that it has in its community. This Community Parks Initiative goes to the heart of what it means to talk about and care about equity. This year's renewed push for parks equity is a credit to the mayor and a sign that having everyone, government, conservancies, and all stakeholders at the table is critical for building healthy parks across the city and especially where those parks are most needed. I thank everyone who has worked to make today a reality. I thank everyone who has invested, because these dollars are a critical part of this, and I look forward to continuing to deal with the equity crisis with the partners you see here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. So in the City Council, our Parks Chair, Mark Levine, has been a very powerful voice, a very persistent voice. He is uh, a kind and uh, decent human being. He is a gentleman, except when it turns to Parks advocacy, <laughs> in which point he becomes a pit bull. The chair of the committee, Mark Levine. I'm glad you didn't say a Yorkie Terrier or something like that. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, hey, kids, are you having fun? Raise your hand if this is more fun than school. Oh, wow. We're going to keep it going all day for you. Um, there you go. Tell your teachers that. Long meetings. Um, Mr. Mayor, where did you go? He's so hard to miss. Where did he go? There he is. Okay. Uh, I really want to thank you while he's listening to his trusted advisor for so powerfully and effectively making the case that progressive values aren't just relevant in conversations about housing and wages, but also very much in conversations about green space and public space, because these are essential to the health and welfare of communities, and progressives have a duty to ensure that all the communities in our city benefit from these types of uh, public spaces. And thank you, sir, for uh, helping us fulfill that duty here today. If you missed what I said, it was it really great. quite flattering. It quite great. flattering. <laughs> like it's special. 
Uh, I want to thank our Parks Commissioner, uh, Mitchell Silver, who, from the day he set foot in the arsenal, his passion for the issue of parks equity was just so palpable. And he pushed th forward um, through many barriers to bring this bold plan to fruition. So thank you, sir, for that leadership. And, and to my predecessor as chair of the Parks Committee, no one has to explain to her about the challenges and needs and promise and possibilities of our parks. And it's why she has just been steadfast in advocating for city council money to go to things like maintenance and programming in parks, which are now so central to this plan. And I also want to thank, lastly, uh, Tupper Thomas and New Yorkers for Parks, who have been an amazing thought leader. Just amazing thought leader um, uh, in helping this come together for, for our city. So thank you for that. You know, the story of public space in New York City uh, for years, to use a phrase that the mayor would understand, has really been a story of two park systems, a tale of two park systems, where we've had a small number of large and medium sized uh, parks that have prospered thanks in large part to a welcome investment of public capital dollars. At the same time, the smaller neighborhood parks around the city have been forced to survive on a stagnant public budget. And these parks are not world famous, they're not on anyone's tourist map, but they are so critical to the health of their neighborhoods. They are a source of public safety. They have the potential to help communities build social capital. They are good for our physical health. They promote exercise. They contribute to environmental sustainability and resilience. But if we neglect those spaces, then that potential is lost. And sadly, that has been happening for too long in too many parks throughout this city, especially low-income communities and communities of color. And I am so happy that today we are making an effort to change that. In 35 of these precious public spaces that are not on anyone's tourist map, but are so critical to the health of their surrounding neighbors. And we're not making the mistake, which is so common, of just putting in capital money and walking away. We have put on the table $6 million for the kinds of gardeners and maintenance workers and playground employees that really make parks usable in the long term. And we are tapping the expertise of partners like the City Parks Foundation and Partnership for Parks with an investment of $1.2 million in the kinds of outreach workers and organizers that help communities build their own infrastructure to become stewards of their parks. I'm so proud, uh, Mr. Mayor, that we've come together uh, in all arms of government to make this plan a reality. I'm so proud of my council colleagues who really have been passionate about funding parks and particularly the kind of maintenance operation which is so critical to this plan. And I'm thrilled that today we're all together in all branches of government uh, to really turn around 35 public parks so they can be the kinds of wonderful open spaces that they can and should be. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got one last speaker, and I think she's going to give us uh, the most important perspective because it's the most grassroots perspective, you know, all over the city. Uh, neighborhood residents have done all they could to make their parks work, work regardless of whether they had all the resources they deserved or not. They've struggled to make things work locally, and they deserve a lot of credit for hanging in there. And one of them has been a real leader in this effort has been Martha Lopez Gilpin, who is the co-chair of the Astoria Park Alliance. We welcome you, Martha. Good morning. Okay, he didn't do it. On behalf of Astoria Park Alliance, it is my honor to be here representing emerging, emerging community advocacy organizations from across this great city. I the Community Parks Initiative is going to empower hardworking and passionate New Yorkers to improve urban space and by doing so, change lives. Like myself, there are many New Yorkers who are willing to roll up their sleeves in an effort to make gardens, parks, playgrounds, and other publicly accessible spaces vibrant centers of their communities. In 2006, I organized the post-July 4th cleanup in Astoria Park because the delicious leftover garbage was causing apocalyptic episodes for my dog's stomach. <laughs> At that time, I had no idea that the lady striding across the lawn to meet me was going to change my life. Her name was Helen Ho, 
and now she works for the mayor's office. At that time, Helen was the Western Queen's Outreach Coordinator for Partnership for Parks. When you are a community member who sees a need and wants to make a lasting difference, you need a friend, a friend who can get work done. Partnership for Parks will be that friend for the folks this initiative seeks to empower. The organization helped Jules Corkery and I found Astoria Park Alliance in 2007 and has been a stalwart support system for us up to this day. Our butterfly garden, bulletin board, t-shirts, brochures were all made possible through PFP's capacity fund grants. Each of our outreach coordinators for PFP has been an invaluable mentor. Helen launched and guided us as we navigated the mysterious ways of city agencies while also connecting us to elected and appointed officials. Joe Block provided perspective and taught us patience as our stewardship grew. Nicole Henderson has embraced our passion and focused our energies as we move into the next phase of our development into a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. Through it all, Christy DiCario has been a patient angel and mentor for our fiscal sponsorship. Queensborough Parks Commissioner Dorothy Lewandowski has been an inspiration. You can give her a hand. Go ahead. Give it up. She has encouraged us to work with city officials and seek out partnerships on all levels. We proudly partner with the Department of Transportation to provide one of New York City's longest running pedestrian street programs, ShoreFest. Our ongoing partnership with New York Cares has produced thousands of volunteer hours for the improvement and conservation of Astoria Park. And New Yorkers for Parks daffodils are waiting to be planted as we speak. The wonderful Norman Chan, Parks District Manager for Districts 1 and 2, We'll be facilitating our efforts at Leaf Fest to rake leaves and turn, in, turn them into compost and to grind up holiday trees as part of Mulch Fest. So I say to you, you sitting here, heroes of Bone Playground, and unspoken heroes of other places in need, you have Bound, sorry, Bound, thank you, Bound Playground, sorry kids. You have friends. You will be their leader the boots on the ground, a tireless advocate for your park, playground, and open space. They will be the spirit guides, the mentors, the dream catchers. With the Community Parks Initiative, your friends at Partnership for Parks, and the significant increase in resources, you will lead your community and forever impact your city. Thank you. Now, before we take our media questions, I just want all the adults here, let's applaud these young people for being so patient. Now, I want to ask the children, would you rather be playing on the playground over there than listening to all of us? Yes! <laughs> all right, thank you for your honesty. Teachers, why don't you take them over there while we do our questions so they can have a little more fun. Follow your teachers that way. I want you to notice my leadership ability. They, I said follow, they all followed. It was very impressive. Okay, they're gonna have a test. Give the people what they want, right, Tish? <laughs> all right, while they're moving over, let's take on topic questions. On topic questions, on topic. So, a year ago, you endorsed Senator Squadron's plan to tax or tithe wealthy conservancies and redirect the money to poor ones. What has changed since? Like what has changed in your thinking about the role of public and private money? Well, my thinking is consistent because I believe we have to do a lot to address these inequities, and it starts with, of course, the public sector making its commitment, which we're doing today. But as I said, I expect the conservancies to play a major role here. Uh, there's a lot of ways to get that done. We've been in real conversation with them, and I hope we'll have something more to say on that quite shortly, but I do expect the conservancies to play an important role. Alive one, in other words. Uh, all ideas are on the table. I think the opportunity has been put forward to the conservancies to come forward with a voluntary plan that really addresses these issues. Do you think parks down the road would opt more for becoming or being involved with conservancies and that conservancies would take care of parks rather than the city? They, in most cases, could never take care of all the needs, by definition. There's a, a few that happen to be uh, very well resourced. Again, we're, we're all adults here. That has to do with geography and income level and demographics. But um, 
I think the point here is that in most communities, there can be a very strong community involvement, and in some ways of getting some resources in on the community level. But it's going to come down to um, the city government playing an active role, and again, some of the better resourced conservancies, I think, have an important role to play as well. Yes, Michael. Do you believe a voluntary plan for the uh, conservancy use is the only viable option now? And what do you say to folks who believe that diverting private donors' money um, to, uh, to a target that wasn't intended is uh, both unfair and unfair? Well, first on the point of um, the very valid concern that anyone would have in conservancies and all the advocates and community residents, you know, if we want to see more investment, let's see the city part first. I think it was very important that we step up Again, put our money where our mouth is and show that we are serious about this. Then it becomes a lot more pertinent and a lot more fair to turn to others and say, now we need you to be a part of the solution. Uh, my point is, I think the conservancies understand this is a priority for this administration. I think they understand that there's uh, some real issues that have to be addressed, and I'm hopeful that they will. So let's let that process play out. I don't deal in hypotheticals, what if. I say there's a process underway, we're going to let that play out. We're hopeful about a very positive outcome. If we find that we want to revisit other options, we'll determine then what makes sense. On topic. How, how exactly, um, I know you said it's voluntary, but, but how, how are you going to engage these conservatives to convince them to contribute money to this plan, especially when you're already putting $130 million of public money? Oh, there's endless need, and in fact, it's the other way around. Because we are investing, it is an encouragement to others to invest. There is, as we mentioned already, some foundation money in the package we're announcing today. It certainly makes sense that private donors, nonprofit donors are going to be encouraged by seeing real action. Uh, so I think that follows coherently. And again, we've been in discussion with the conservancies, and we think we're moving in the right direction. Five of the parks... Uh, Louder? All five, sorry. All five of the Staten Island playgrounds as part of this initiative are located in the north shore of the island or the northeast of the island. Does the south shore or none of the playgrounds in the south... Mitch will come forward and talk about the details, but let me just emphasize the criteria involves where there's a lot of population growth, where there's densely populated neighborhoods, where there's a lot of low-income residents, where there's a lot of need in terms of lack of previous investment. So when you think about all those criteria, for example, where there hasn't even been $250,000 of investment over two decades, that's what pinpoints it. It's not saying, are we doing a perfect geographical distribution? It's where has there been disinvestment or lack of investment? How do we have to address that? This is also part one. Again, we expect to be doing more on the public side over the coming years. We expect support from the uh, conservancies and other players. So this is part one, but it was about addressing these criteria. The mayor answered the question accurately. Uh, when we started this assessment of those parks in New York City that received less than 250,000 over 20 years, the number was 215 parks. Uh, we then developed a methodology to look a bit further to prioritize those parks, and we had to look at a couple of factors. The mayor mentioned what those were. It was population density, uh, it was growth, uh, it was poverty, and also we looked at our maintenance records and our capacity to really uh, build some incredible parks and recreate them in the future. Uh, it so happened that in Staten Island, those parks were located on the North Shore. Uh, but we also want to emphasize that we'll be addressing 55 other sites in addition to the 35 with some quick fixes, uh, painting and fencing, some other things to get immediate needs in those parks. Uh, but to answer the question, uh, those parks on the North Shore are the ones through our criteria that, that rise to, to the top of being the most in need. Henry. To address Mr. Saul's question about people who donated money to the specific park, Mitch is going to answer part of that. I think this is an all hands on deck dynamic. I think you heard leader after leader talk about how urgent the need is and how it's gone unaddressed for decades. So the point is, there's lots of people we need to be a part of this. And the conservancies, the big conservancies, already have a tremendous amount of ability, uh, capacity, capacity both in terms of their staff and their uh, teams, but and, and their ability to get things done. Also, capacity in terms of a ready-made group of supporters and donors who believe in parks. But there's also other tools we're using right now. Mitch. 
right now we have certain partners, and they're here with us today. I see David Moore, the, uh, the chair of the City Parks Foundation. We have the City Parks Foundation. We have the Mayor's Fund, and the First Lady has a commitment uh, to open space. And so there are opportunities for people that want to give that will help supplement the work that we're doing in parks. Uh, so if people want to give, there are many opportunities. Uh, and so we encourage them to give because we believe that uh, this is just one effort, but we could take as many resources as possible to create a great park system for all New Yorkers. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, you had one before. Dave. Mayor, can you just explain or maybe Mr. Tan on what the $36 million of the DEP money is? Let the commissioner explain that. What is the DEP money there to do? Uh, we have a commitment to uh, reduce stormwater going into the sewers. Um, that accomplishes two goals. It reduces our carbon footprint because less money goes to our wastewater treatment plants. And during heavy rain, it reduces combined sewer overflows into the surrounding waterways. So for us, working in parks where there's a lot of open space to do rainwater uh, landscaping, to do porous surfaces, to do stormwater detention below the surface, is a tremendous opportunity to address these problems. Okay, on topic. What percentage of conservancy budgets would you like to see, like, in an ideal world, you know, to help out the smaller parks? You know, I think part of the idea is we're having a real conversation to figure out what makes sense. Um, I think the need is tremendous all over the city. We want to ask the conservancies to help us out again. There's lots of ways they can do it. Uh, through their donor base, through their uh, capacity they have already on their staff. Uh, but the need is tremendously great. So we have to figure out what's a fair standard based on the needs we have and what they have available to help with. Okay, Dana and then Rich. I guess this might be a question for the commissioner, but do you have any sense of what the overall capital need, unmet capital need of the park system is right now? A lot of money. <laughs> I, I don't know the overall need for the entire park system. When we looked at the 250, 15 parks, uh, it was $1 billion to address those parks that had not received funding or at least under 250 in over 20 years. That was a significant estimate, but in terms of the whole park system, I don't have that number, but in terms of just those 215, it would be $1 billion. Rich? Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the phrase benign neglect was used and uh, applied to the Bloomberg administration's attitude toward these parks. Do you think it was benign neglect, willful ignorance, or just a focus on the bigger parks, or what, what goes through your mind? I, you know, I think we believe fundamentally in an agenda fighting inequality. I think it's front and center in the philosophy of this administration, and it applies to everything we're doing. It doesn't matter if you're talking about schools or job creation or parks. It's the way we see the world. I think it's fair to say the previous administration didn't see the world that way. So it just wasn't a priority. I think that's the best way of saying it. It wasn't a priority. Um, and a lot of these neighborhood parks went for years without the investment they deserve. And we have a lot of making up to do. That's part of why uh, we're clear this is going to be a multi-year solution with a lot of different players involved that we expect to really get each park up to the level uh, that the residents of the community deserve. Go ahead. One more. What is the role of the Parks Foundation in all of this and, and, and their... Uh... So I'll start and then pass to Mitch. Again, uh, Mitch is right. Uh, the Mayor's Fund and the First Lady are very focused on open space. Parks Foundation is there to bring in resources for all of our parks. Uh, we want them to play a very active and aggressive role helping us uh, solve this problem. Uh, Mitch can speak to the specifics more. Clearly, the City Parks Foundation uh, is a partner, and part of this effort, we'll be creating 14 outreach coordinators through the Partnership for Parks initiative. Many of them are right here with us today. Uh, they'll be going out to these 35 locations, and each location will have an outreach coordinator to help build the stewards to make sure these parks uh, really flourish going forward. But if City, City Parks Foundation is, is a strong supporter in creating the programming in so many of our parks, and so they're committed to be a partner in this, but the real key is those 14 outreach coordinators that will help build strong s stewards and caretakers for all these 35 parks going forward. Okay, we're going to do, is that on or off? All right, you have to wait for me to say it. Now we'll do off. Grace, there. <laughs> uh, there, were, there were three uh, Build It Back employees who spoke last week to New York One raising concerns about security at the site that they worked at in Fort Tilden. One of them said one of her clients Metal detector to ensure that somebody who's 
plane go by for you. Great answer. That's my whole answer. On the second question, our info on the second question, our information is the reverse of what you're saying, that our understanding is the employees were fired for cause and then spoke to the media. Uh, on the first question, we take the security at the sites very seriously. Uh, we have security plans in place at each site. We believe they're strong. Um, we are working very hard to make the Build It Back program work better for people. Um, I think a year ago, people had every right to feel they were getting nowhere. Today, and I've talked to a lot of people uh, who are working through Build It Back and feel much better about the experience. Um, we set the targets for Labor Day of over 500 uh, construction starts, over 500 reimbursement checks. Those targets were met and surpassed. Since then, there's been continued activity, another 120-plus construction starts, another 150-plus reimbursement checks. Uh, over these last few weeks. More will be announced shortly. So it's clear that Build It Back has been turning the corner rapidly and more and more people are being served more quickly. So I think the good news is that anyone who reaches out to Build It Back can expect a much more respectful, much more effective response than they received a year ago. But we always care about the people who do the work and we do protect them. It's a, it's a broad question, so I would say I think in our society we need to be more mindful of where the boundaries should be. And uh, when the dynamics do not involve anything that affects city business, I would agree with your question. I'm not sure it is the city's business when there isn't a pertinent reason to look into it. Mayor, Internal Affairs is now looking at another video involving a police officer, this one involving a 16-year-old drug suspect um, who was struck by the police officer with a gun. Seen the video? Are you aware of it? What do you think? And also, just all these videos that have surfaced in the last couple of weeks over all your concern about whether we see a pattern in the police department. A couple different things. Uh, thank you for the question, but it's got a lot of parts, so let me, let me try and work it through. I have not seen the video. I have received a summation of what's in the video. Clearly, Commissioner Bratton has seen the video and reacted very uh, aggressively in the sense of saying that there have to be consequences when uh, anything's done the wrong way. There's a full investigation going on, as always, with internal affairs. But as you know, uh, one officer has been suspended without pay. Another's on modified duty. Hold on a second. What is this, the loudest corner in New York City today? Is your neighborhood always this loud? There we go. There you go. So, um, I think the commissioner has set a very clear standard, and I commend him. Uh, I, I've said many times Commissioner Bratton is the finest police leader in America. He has the most extraordinary track record of driving crime down and keeping it low. And he has uh, the respect of police officers all over New York City, all over this country. But he also holds a high standard for the profession. Uh, if you listen to Commissioner Bratton talk about the profession, it's been his whole life. He honors it. He wants everyone to honor it. He spoke very powerfully last Thursday about the standards he holds for the men and women of the NYPD. So I think it's been very clear when the commissioner sees something that he thinks is inappropriate, he acts very quickly and sends a message to everyone that we're holding a high standard here uh, for how our police officers interact with our communities. Um, as for the question of what does it mean, I think the fact is that we're getting a kind of information we didn't used to have before the age of the uh, cell phone camera. And uh, we're seeing some things that uh, maybe they existed uh, in large measure before. We can't tell for sure because we didn't have the documentation. We do know now what we're seeing. And it's important that every time we get evidence of something that might have been done wrong, that there's a full investigation and, where appropriate, that there are consequences. We're obviously acting also to ensure that we have a stronger civilian complaint review board, uh, where citizens can have the assurance that they bring a complaint that there's a real outcome, and an outcome that's speedy and fair both to the citizens involved and the officers involved. So a lot of change is happening, but I see these videos as another a piece of information that we need to use to 
improve the relationship between police and community, and in many cases to heal the relationship between police and community. Cross Hudson Rail Tunnel is a priority for this region. It should have happened, uh, it should have been begun years ago. I, with all due respect to Governor Christie, I think he made a mistake in pulling out of that project. Um, we all have to get on the same page. You know, the two states, uh, the city, Amtrak, everyone has to get on the same page, and I'm going to be enthusiastically a part of that process. It's premature to talk about the exact role, but I can tell you it will be a priority. Mr. Mayor, uh, what can you or the Parks Commissioner tell us about the bear cub that was found in, the, in Central Park? <laughs> yeah. Do we have any? Uh, I, I don't have much update information. I do know that uh, NYPD uh, it was investigating. The Central Park Conservancy was on the scene. Our Parks Enfor Enforcement was on the scene. What was reported was we knew it was a baby cub. We're not sure how it was uh, placed there, and that's just an ongoing investigation. The bear was apparently stabbed. Do you have, uh... I don't have all those details, so I'm sorry I could not definitively uh, confirm that. Just going to take a point of privilege. We've closed up on questions, but I just want to add on one more topic here because I think it's important. Um, a lot of people paying attention on the uh, enterovirus. Uh, as some of you may know, I happen to be an asthmatic. I have a mild case of asthma. My wife and daughter do as well. So uh, issues, respiratory issues, issues that might affect asthmatics are very much a concern to my family. And I just want to make sure the facts are out there because there has been concern in recent days on what this means for people in New York City. So Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is monitoring hospital admissions all over the city uh, to make sure that we're looking for any trends that we have to act on. What they're looking for is uh, particularly cases where people who have asthma or respiratory issues are experiencing severe symptoms, flu-like symptoms that are particularly severe. Um, here's the important part. I'm going to ask our colleagues in the media to help get this out to the public. Parents uh, with children, particularly children with asthma or other respiratory problems, it's crucial to make sure those children get the flu shot. It's time to get the flu shot in general, but it's particularly important as a defense against this virus. And any other vaccines that parents are not up to date on, this is a good moment to get those done to protect your children. And if you see your children showing symptoms, unusual symptoms, a cold or cough or something that seems to be more sustained than usual, it's important to seek medical attention to make sure you get ahead of it. So uh, just want everyone to recognize that this is something that can be addressed, particularly if parents are um, proactive about getting the flu shot and the vaccines. But if uh, they are concerned their child may be experiencing some unusual symptoms, very important to seek medical help and people can call 311 if they need further information. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Hey,